Welcome to another ABC Radio National podcast. For more information, go to abc.net.au slash rn. Hello, I'm Richard Aidey. You're on ABC Radio National. Welcome to Life Matters. How important is home? Let me be more specific. How important is our upbringing in terms of how we turn out? What kind of people we are? Last week, you might remember, we spoke to Marilyn French, the author of The Women's Room. And one of the things she said was that bringing up children is the most important job in the world. All parents believe that what they're doing, what we're doing, is important. More than that, many believe that it's the most influential thing they will ever do. Think about it. Few of us are Nelson Mandela or Winston Churchill or Howard Florey. So the single biggest way we can affect the world in, say, 50 years from now is how we bring up our kids, right? Well, our first guest today says it ain't that simple. In fact, she says the most crucial aspects of a child environment are, a child's environment, I should say, are outside the home. Judith Rich Harris is an independent researcher and the author of No Two Alike. She joins us now from her home in New Jersey. Welcome to Life Matters, Judith. Before we venture outside the home, let's begin with parents. Are you saying that they're not important? Um, They are important in an emotional sense, in a a relationship sense. The child feels that his or her parents are very important people in in his or her life. But in the long run, uh, they don't have much role in shaping the child's personality or in determining how the child will behave outside the home. What about the body of research on the importance of the, of the first two years of life? If you think of those Romanian orphans who were terribly neglected, it did affect their brains. I'm talking about differences in environment within, within normal um, ranges. There are abnormal environments, uh, environments that children weren't designed to live in that can affect them. But I'm talking about the normal home, uh, variations within the normal home, whether the parents are strict or indulgent, whether they are messy or, or well-organized. These sorts of things have no, long, no long-term effects on, on how the children turn out. But if a child doesn't have a parent at all, yes, that is certainly gonna, going to have an effect. And I also believe that severe abuse can have long-term effects. So we're talking about normal homes here. Right, so uh, a normal home where normal nurturing of whatever flavour takes place. So the assumption is that the kids are loved and looked after by their parents. Well, looked after at any rate. Not every kid is, is lovable. And one of the problems I see in modern child rearing is that parents are convinced that they have to love the child no matter what. And so if they don't actually love the child, they pretend to. And that introduces an element of phoniness into modern child rearing that is one of, one of the things I object to. That is, that, that's, that's quite a contentious thing to say, I think. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, you expect to love a child... Uh, so you claim, but, but that's, that's what you have to say nowadays. I love all my children, and I love them all the same. But, but in fact, some children are more lov- lovable than others. I wasn't a very lovable child, and my mother did her best to love me, but I don't think she ever quite succeeded until I was a grown-up. But uh, it did make my childhood less pleasant but I don't think it had any effect on me in the long run. Um, my parents had very different aspirations for me than, than the ones that I had for myself. All right, well, let, let's talk about what has an effect on us in the long run. It seems to me there's, there is a scientific consensus on the importance of genes. It, it, it's not universally accepted by those outside the science community, but within the scientific community there's a consensus. How much do genes determine how we turn out? Well, only, only to a degree. They are important, but they don't explain everything. If you look at, at variation among children, for example, some children are smarter than others or some are more active or outgoing, these differences among children are about 50% due to differences in their genes. And what, what the genes accomplish most, most often is to make the children resemble their parents. 
also that psychologists have looked at the fact that neat parents tend to have neat children or um, aggressive parents tend to have aggressive children, and they have attributed that to the children's to the children's environment. But in fact, it's mostly due to the genes the children inherit from their parents. The part of personality that is not inherited by the parents, because as I said, genes only account for part of it, mm -hmm. that's become a mystery because it used to be assumed that it was the home environment, but the more they look for specific things in the home environment that can be blamed for the children's characteristics, the less they are able to find it. And that's why I turned to the environment outside the home, because my reasoning was that this is where children are destined to spend their adult lives, and childhood is, after all, preparation for adulthood. So why not look outside the home to see the, the factors that have formative effects on children? On Life Matters today, our guest is Judith Rich Harris, who's the author of uh, No Two Alike, Human Nature and Human Individuality. And we're talking about uh, where, how we are shaped by uh, the world, and uh, uh, Judith Rich Harris has some interesting things to say on this. Now, you, you say that uh, we now know that the most crucial aspects of a child's environment aren't in the home. How do we know that? We don't know that for sure, but what we do know for sure is that they aren't in the home, because if we look at children reared in different kinds of homes, we cannot blame these different kinds of homes on the characteristics that they have that are not inherited. That's become very clear in the last 30 years. If you, if you do the right kind of study, which, which involve, the right kind of research, which involves using uh, methods that control for the effects of genes, mm. then it turns out that the effects of the home environment are nil. Um, for example, identical twins separated at birth and reared in different homes are as alike in personality as... Um, identical twins reared in the same home. So that leaves us with what? Daycare, schools, neighbourhoods, communities? Right. Um, culture is, is clearly important, the culture outside the home, and um, experiences with people outside the home, especially peers, but perhaps also other people such as teachers. So all the efforts that parents put in to make their children say, less aggressive or less shy, really it won't amount to much. It's in their genes or it's the influences outside the home, which I hope in a moment we'll explore. I feel that parents are putting in too much effort. They're putting in so much effort that they're not really able to enjoy being parents anymore. It's become, it's become almost like a contest between parents that they, they feel as though they're going to be graded on their child-rearing efforts and that um, it's impossible to work too hard on being a parent. I don't think any of this is true. I think that this notion that parents have to put in effort has taken all the enjoyment out of being a parent and, and as I said, made home life not only fraught with anxiety, but also somewhat phony. All right, then. Well, what's going on in a child's mind? Or more explicitly, how is a child's character being formed in those environments outside the home? The way I explain it, there, there are a lot of mysterious things um, that, that researchers have found in the last 30 years about development. And it took me a long time to come up with a theory that would account for all of them. Um, in order to do so, I had to make use of a concept from a field called evolutionary psychology. And this concept is that the mind is not a unitary learning organ and it doesn't learn everything in the same way. Instead, it is composed of, of separate mechanisms or what they call modules, each of which is, responds to a different aspect of the environment and which learns things in different ways. So I, I feel, um, according to my theory, there are the children, children are born with three uh, mental mechanisms that permit them to accomplish the social goals of childhood. The first is the relationship system, and this is, what, this is the one in which parents loom large. In relationships, parent, relationships with parents are very important. 
and this this goes on in the in the child's mind very consciously. The child is aware of all the people in his or her life. The set, other two mental mechanisms I talk about do have to do with the child's environment outside the home primarily. Um, there's the socialization system, and that adapts the child to the to the culture that the child grows up in. To fit in, in effect. Yes, right. To fit in, the child's goal in the, uh, for the socialization system, the goal is to um, to look normal, to do what the other children do. But at the same time, there's another goal, and that is to be better than other children. So the child has these two. Um, often conflicting goals. One is to be the same as other children, and the other is to be better than the other children, to, to compete with them in some way. And, and that's why I feel that we need different um, brain mechanisms to explain these two things. You, you, so, you, you call this, this second system the, the status system, which, which makes intuitive sense. And, and this one, it would seem, is the key one, because how we differ, how we stand out, is what makes us unique. Well, the way I now understand development is that the socialization system has, has to do with socializing the child, which means um, teaching the child to behave appropriately for his or her culture. But you're quite right. In, in personality development, the status system is the, the important one. The child has to measure herself against her peers to, to figure out what she's good at and what she's not good at and um, develop a strategy for being better in some way or at least competing successfully in some way. And this, this requires the acquisition of self-knowledge. And for self-knowledge, you really need peers because you can't tell. For example, a child can't tell how smart he is by um, asking himself, do I know more like my fa- more than my father? Obviously, he, a child doesn't know more than his father. But if he knows more than the other children his age, then he can s- consider himself smart. How, how conscious are we of all this when we're, when we're doing it, when we're, I suppose, walking this balance between trying to fit in and trying to work out what we're good at so as to come up with, a, I suppose, a, a way of living that will make us com- at least compete and hopefully excel? That's a good question because a lot of this goes on underground and we're not conscious of it at all. And that's why if you ask people why they turned out the way they did, they'll, they'll say things that they believe and that sound very convincing to themselves and other people, but that may, not, that may be quite misleading because the real things that made them turn out the way they did weren't things that they were conscious of while they were happening, especially the socialization, socialization system. Most of that goes on unconsciously, and um, the child who thinks that he's behaving the way he does because his mother told him to may be quite incorrect. That's, in fact, going back to what you call the relationship system earlier, the one that's overt and there from the beginning and that that fills our memories of childhood and of course affects how we see our own children. Exactly, yes, yes. The relationship system dominates the conscious mind and makes people think that relationships have more role in their lives than they actually do. I think they do have a big role in in how happy we are. A child who doesn't have a, a happy home life is unhappy just as an adult who doesn't have a happy home life is unhappy. But that doesn't mean it leaves long-term effects on their personalities. No, indeed. Well, uh, just finally then, given the importance of what happens outside the home in the peer group and the school and the playground and the community, and given that parents can't control all this, what can parents do to foster what they might think of as good outcomes? do this automatically they've been for a long time people have chosen to rear their children in a location where they feel in tune with the other people who live there and um it works if you want your children to be religious for example you move to a religious community or you um send your children to a religious school 
and they the chances are much better that they will become religious adults by getting together with other parents who have similar ideas parents can have an effect by by having an effect on the um, environment well on the school for example um, parents who send their children to a private school what they're doing is picking a environment where they have something in common with the other parents who send their children to the same school and judith just before we let you go it sounds also like you're saying lighten up enjoy your children don't treat them like a project exactly that's that's very well put well it's been incredibly interesting and thank you so much for joining us today Thank you for having me. Judith Rich Harris is an independent psychologist and researcher. Her most recent book is No Two Alike, Human Nature and Human Individuality, which is published by Norton and available in July in Australia. She also wrote Why Home Doesn't Matter in the May edition of Prospect magazine. You'll find details of all of that on our website, which is abc.net.au slash rn slash Life Matters. This is Life Matters on ABC Radio National.